Um, we move to a slightly different scale at this point. We move back to um, our local star. And although I will cover, thank you, some of the ground you'll see pictures you've seen before and some you haven't, um, what I want to try and do is also uh, I don't know, put in some of the ethos, some of the things that um, people looked for what they thought they knew about and found them sometimes, but in the process found things they didn't know about. And that thread will run through, um, I, I guess earlier in the week it's been called serendipity. And informed serendipity is perhaps the other interesting concept. All right. Is it moving on? No. There we go. Okay. So, like everybody else, I issue my congratulations and you know, to the um, laureates. And actually, thank you also for inviting me to talk. So, I'm going to discuss some of this discovery observations and then move to recent work. Um, and also, I want to try and um, give you some of the sort of structure, some of the nomenclature as we go through. So, there is. Um, a view of the sun, an artist's impression, clearly. We have the core where the nuclear reactions happen. Beyond that, well, what I always thought of as a nice quiet zone, but maybe Connie will tell me it isn't so quiet at all. And then for the sun, the outer 30% or so by radius is a zone, um, convection zone, where convection is the dominant transport mechanism for heat, a very efficient process, and you get turbulence on very many scales. And turbulence is absolutely fundamental to what we're able to see. And when I talk about C, um, clearly I'm going to talk about it in many different contexts. Um, but when we, if we're foolish enough to look at the sun or um, through a suitably attenuated telescope, you tend to see the photosphere, which is where the visible radiation um, comes from. Um, now, I said we had granulation on the surface, of convection in the outer regions of the sun. We get granulation on the surface. Um, so a Hinode optical um, picture, but taken from space. Um, and usually just one sunspot on the surface. And you see it magnified up. So you see the sunspot dark, except it's not really dark, it's just, relatively speaking, dark. And there's a whole topic there about when people first saw sunspots and thought, yeah, we could go and live there, nice temperature, just a bit, you know, nice, but not right. Um, and you see around that um, sunspot, you see the granules, you see granulation, um, small scale, I might say, but on the other hand, if you look at the uh, top right-hand corner, you can see the Earth, so it's only small scale as far as the sun is concerned. Granules are smaller than the Earth, but not, not massively. And the other thing is that, as we've heard, the sun is rotating, so that one part of the sun will be coming towards me at any one time, and the other part will be going away from me. I can image that with the Doppler effect. And this is HMI, space data. So you can see blue approach, red, recession, somewhat different um, redshifts from what we've been talking about before. Here I've got plus minus two kilometers per second, kind of small. Uh, and in the center, I have this sort of gray zone, and that's because the motion is going from one way to the other way and is transverse, and I'm therefore not measuring a Doppler effect. And also on the surface is this mottliness, and that's the granulation and also the oscillations. So that's the surface. What about the interior? There's a very famous quote that um, many people use. Sir Arthur Eddington, a very eminent Cambridge astronomer, mm -hmm. who in 1926 wrote that at first sight, it would seem that the deep interior of the sun and stars is less accessible to scientific investigation than any other region of the universe. Now, you have to remember this is early days of cosmology, right? So it's an extraordinary statement to make. Um, our telescopes may probe farther and farther into the depths of space, 
but how can we ever obtain certain knowledge of what is hidden beneath the barriers, the photosphere, the thing we see? What appliance can pierce through the outer layers of a star and test? He was interested in testing physics, testing the conditions within. Now, he was a good theorist, in spite of the picture in, um, uh, you know, with his um, telescope there. Um, the other comment I would make is, uh, Hanke normally wore glasses, but didn't want them for the picture. <laughs> That's my inference. Anyway, Eddington's answer was that theory would solve all the problems. However, I feel obliged to put a but in here, because, as Roger has talked about, we had new observations many years later, 30-odd years later, um, where Leighton discovered the motion on the surface of the sun. I won't go into all the detail because Roger's told you it, but what I wanted to say is they expected to see rotation, and they did see rotation. They expected to see granulation, and they did see granulation, but they discovered that there was a periodic component to it, which they didn't expect to see. So this lovely meter rule, I love that description, going up and down. Um, they showed that the oscillations were radial, so in the center of the sun, center of your image, rather, they're coming towards you or away from you, and you get less visibility as you move to the edges because it becomes transverse. And that's something that we'll come back to. They also took a huge amount of care to prove that these were solar phenomena. And the effects of the Earth's atmosphere through which they were measuring were not what you were seeing. I know that in some of the later stages, George Isaac and so on, that the observations, people would say, you're measuring tiny effects, it's the Earth's atmosphere. Go away. <laughs> you know, we can't possibly fund you, which actually was the consequence. Anyway. These became the five-minute oscillations. And Roger explained what it was all about. And I just want to skip to the quote at the end here, which I'm sure Roger remembers, that he's grateful to Professor R.F. Christie for suggesting that his unexpected result, that the oscillations are self-exciting, might be more than a numerical error which I thought was a lovely comment, um, and indicative. So we move into helioseismology. Now, I have to say here that, that the stars can oscillate is not news. There's a fundamental period of oscillation dependent on, inversely dependent on the density that's been known for perhaps 100 years, and seen for some stars, um, Cepheids being one of the big examples. But Resolved, non-radial oscillations on the surface of the sun was a breakthrough. That's not the same as what this was talking about. And the fundamental oscillation period of the sun had not been observed. Um, I have to dispute Jan slightly here. This is the um, early observations that provoked him and Douglas into lots of discussions, and there was a suggestion that what was being seen was 2.65 hours, the fundamental um, gravest mode of oscillation of the sun. And you began to look at all the stuff. Um, sadly, um, Jan described it as rubbish, crap. Oh, that, that wasn't what it was. But... <laughs> It was a real effect, but it wasn't how it was interpreted, is my understanding. Um, and um, you've seen the problems of trying to... You know, Connie was talking about trying to get data when you're working from the ground. Um, if you have data that have gaps in, day-night gaps, you have a periodicity which turns up in your spectrum of 11.57 microhertz, engraved on my heart. And... It's believed that what was seen was actually the ninth harmonic of the day. However, the signal that was thought to be granulation there, random, is expected, and it was there, turned out not to be granulation, or not to be solely granulation. Um, the Birmingham group, I wasn't there at the time, um, Claverie et al. showed that with observations from multiple sites that disproved that this was just 
gravity waves in our atmosphere, that this might be oscillations of the sun. And the absolute breakthrough came from the Nice group, and you've seen, I must rub that picture actually, of the South Pole, I haven't seen that before, um, that these were oscillations of the global sun. But again, you have to remember that the concept that sound waves could travel all the way through the sun, come back, and do it again and again and again. People just thought it wasn't reasonable, that the int interior conditions were so turbulent that you couldn't possibly get a coherent signal. And yet, that was what was seen. So you have the Grec et al. papers, um, which show you these beautiful sharp lines. From the width of the line, you can make a guess as to what an estimate, not a guess, an estimate of what the lifetime is. And so you're seeing 3 millihertz, 3,000 microhertz, five-minute periods, and the line width tells you that the, the modes have a lifetime of days. Right, so these are really high Q resonances. Oops. And very many observations flowed from that, which um, I won't really discuss. But I just want to um, reiterate, sort of reinforce a point here, that the sun resonates like a musical instrument. And the first concept, and you've heard it already from Connie and so on, if you have a little instrument, you expect the note to be high. If you have a great big double bass, you expect it to be low. But it's more than that. If someone, you um, orchestras tune on A, as I understand it, not being very musical, and if a trumpet plays the note and a piano plays the note, you can say, that's a trumpet, that's the piano. They're playing the same note, but what's different is the overtone structure. So it's not just what the note is, it's what the other notes that get provoked at the same time. It's the fact that you've got more than one frequency that's so very powerful. So we have motion in the volume of the sun due to sound waves, pressure, the restoring force, thought to be driven in the outer layers of the convection zone, causes minute movements of the surface, and it can be detected as a Doppler velocity or as an intensity change. Intensity change from the ground is really tricky. Um, most, people, a lot, most people from the ground will work with Doppler velocity. So velocity, uh, a few centimeters per second in the speed of light, um, part in 10 to the 9, part in 10 to the 10. This is precision spectroscopy. If you're working in uh, intensity, you're talking, as Connie said, about um, micromagnitudes, a millionth. It's not easy stuff to do. And therefore, you can understand at the beginning, when people were used to kilometers per second being quite a good measurement, when someone says, I can measure centimeters per second, yeah. OK, so Jan and Douglas set to work. Um, and now I have to go back to Eddington and say, well, actually, he had a point. Theory is very powerful. Um, they had lots of inferences that they either drew at the time or could draw very shortly afterwards. The sun's not metal poor. Rotation rate in the interior can be determined. I think it's true to say you settled the depth of the convection zone for the first time. I think you de deepened it, make it bigger, if I remember correctly. Yes. And you could use inversion techniques to model the solar interior. Um, We've seen plots as to how well the existing models matched the, um, the observations, but that it wasn't good enough. And you've been introduced to Model S, which I call the industry standard. <laughs> OK, now I want to move on to talk about some of the other results. And I have to make choices. Sad. Um, so I'm going to talk about the solar activity cycle, because that's something that really interests me and about solar rotation, but solar rotation in the context, really, of um, the solar cycle. And then I'll move on to probing the uh, nuclear burning at the hearts of stars. You've already seen the new look, so, solar neutrino problem discussed by several people. Fantastic. So I will concentrate on the onset <coughs> of helium burning in red giants. But first, I want to just give you a tiny bit of notation. You've here talk about the order. That's n, the number of 
uh, nodes as you move radially. The fundamental is the first one. We have degree L, which is sort of pole to pole, latitude variation. And you have the azimuth, which is around, usually associated with rotation, with, yeah, with rotation, longitude. And I'm about to show you an illustration, a cartoon, of what one mode, and you never see one mode, but what one mode of the sun might look like. And I've given you there its radial order and its degree and its azimuthal order. The numbers are there for, because I want to give you the numbers, but don't worry about them. That's what the image looks like. So Doppler colored um, a snapshot, um, red and blue. The interesting thing about this is that this picture is going to give you the sensitivity of this particular mode to the volume of the sun. It is not sensitive to the whole volume of the sun. It sees nothing about the poles. It sees nothing about the center. Now, you might think, that one, let's not bother with that one. But that's not true. It's because each mode is sensitive to a slightly different volume that you can build a map. It's like a CT scan. You move the x-rays round, and then you can interpret those um, in terms of um, an image of a map. Uh, I'm interested in the ones, very unlike this one, that go right into the core of the sun. To see these, you need spatial resolution on the surface. Um, and I said I was interested. This is the Birmingham Solar Oscillations Network, known as BISON. You've seen plots, which I think are BISON data, um, several times today. We have six stations around the world, relatively speaking, mid-latitudes. Um, we want to beat the diurnal variation. Um, it's not true, but the statement I would make is the sun never sets on our empire. <laughs> and I speak as someone who's actually not British. Um, we got our first data, which was single site, short episodic, you know, short campaigns in 1975. We got our network in 91. And by the skin of our teeth, we are still running. We're still collecting data. Um, as um, Per said, I was appointed to Birmingham in 84, and I came from actually an industrial background, from build, taking research instrumentation and turning it into commercial instrumentation. And one of the tasks we had to do, having built our beautiful interferometric system, our interferometer, it had to be dropped. We had to give it a push and had to allow it fall. And the rules were that it had to still work. It had to be within the range of the alignment of the servo systems, because customers were bound to let it drop. Um, and one of the things that actually drove me back to universities rather than industry was I also wasn't allowed to tell them how good the instrument was. We had to give them a number that was poorer than the performance. So everybody felt they'd got a really good one. <laughs> anyway, was, that was the background, not solar physics at all. That, that brought me in here to turn what was campaign-based work into something that would operate all year, all day, computer-controlled, run from Birmingham. It's um, quite something, actually. OK, so there were expectations that said the sun was a constant star, and it isn't. I showed you a picture with one sunspot on it. That's unusual. Normally speaking, um, you have lots of sunspots. You can see in this picture, which is sunspot number, against uh, four centuries of data, that the number varies. I'm sure you all know it. 11-year solar cycle, the height of the cycle, total number of sunspots, varies quite markedly. Um, There's the famous Maunder minimum around 1650 to 1720, when the sunspots disappeared. Galileo was lucky. He started measuring before the Maunda minimum, and he also started measuring near solar maximum. Otherwise, he might not have observed sunspots, and certain things might have been different. Anyway, the number of spots on the surface varies with time. Um, the sunspots are dark, but they have intense magnetic fields in them, and therefore, I get a little bit nearer you guys with ultraviolet and x-rays and so on that sit above 
the, um, the cool sunspots. Um, and those are very pretty. Most of the very beautiful pictures for the sun are actually of the surface or just above it. Um, but what do the oscillations say? Well, this is discovery by some data, and I've got several points to make about it. First of all, we measure frequencies, and those frequencies are sensitive to the activity measures. And I'll describe the plot in just a minute. And the observations show you that the frequency is highest when the activity is highest. So we have a plot here of a frequency shift as a function of date, um, I've taken this from the original publication, and I apologize for the strange stuff on the bottom. It's meant to be Julian date, but we actually forgot, never even thought to put the 2-4 whatever in front of it, so we actually got flack from someone. <laughs> someone wrote to us and said, well, you got your dates wrong. Um, the data that we observed are in there as symbols with uncertainties. The different symbols are different degrees, different L values, naught, one, two, the ones we measured. So the very early stuff here, there we are, is short campaigns, uh, quite big uncertainties. And then around here, we begin to get network operation, and you can see that the uh, uncertainties get much smaller. We knew we had the drop. We sat and waited till it turned just to be certain. Um, there is a clear correlation between the activity measure and um, the, um, the oscillations. Um, it's not stunning. It was statistically significant, and therefore we went to press with it. That's successive cycles. All right, so there's a slight overlap. That down there is sort of around here. Uh, and you've now got up 85 up to, well, goes past 2015. But, um, and you, you, data are plotted as before with their uncertainties. And then there are a whole string of solar activity measures on here. Um, so if we waited till here, we wouldn't have got our discovery paper. So I encourage you to have faith in your statistics. Um, but the other point to make is, and it's very noticeable here, actually, that none of the activity measures are perfect. And that's an interesting problem as to what we're actually measuring. So nice, clear correlation. And I want to just give you a, oh, perhaps a cautionary tale on, um, is it cause and effect or is it pure chance? Always a good question. So I have a letter to Nature here from 1988, so it predates that publication. It's not by us. And it talks about the role of storks in the instance of live births. So uh, a new parameter for sex education. Sir, it's interesting that in these days it was sir. Uh, there is concern in West Germany over the falling birth rate. The accompanying graph might suggest a solution that every child knows makes sense. So two sets of data plotted. One axis, number of breeding pairs of storks, or pairs of breeding storks, and on the other axis, the number of live births. <laughs> I think we might agree that there is not a correlation. <laughs> there might be an underlying phenomenon that's somehow related, okay? But it was a question that we did have to answer. And Mike Thompson and co-workers showed why we had a correlation with the, shif the shifts in the magnetic field, and that the region responsible was very close to the surface. You got that out of all the different oscillation measurements that we had. So a cautionary tale. So what's happening in the current cycle? Um, we have here predictions. There's a committee that makes predictions. Um, the red is their prediction. The blue and the black are the real data. And we appear to be hitting more activity than was predicted. Now, you have to remember the last few cycles, they got it very wrong <laughs> in that they predicted lots of activity and there wasn't very much. So maybe they've adjusted their algorithms too far and they need to bring it back. You can see the long-term trends down at the bottom here. Um, and maybe it'll even peak before they said it would, actually, which I think is one interpretation out of that. Anyway. 
And I should also clearly make the point that um, solar activity is not just of interest to me and how it alters my oscillations, um, but it's very important for space weather. And that's why a lot of this work is done. Rotation is another way of looking at this cycle. Um, we'll tell you what helioseismology tells you about the internal rotation rate. Um, but first, tell me, I'll tell you what the surface says, just so you have a context. So, as you've already been told, faster at the equator than at the poles, roughly 25 days here, um, 35 days or so up there. Not solid body, because it's not solid. And you can use the two-dimensional data to um, produce a map. So many, many, many modes, so you can get really good mapping. And Jan showed you this. So the color scale is red to yellow to green to blue. Uh, the data used here were not, it did not include the bison-type data that go right into the core. Um, you can't see the poles very well because of the radial oscillation and the fact it's almost um, across your line of sight. And you find that the numbers do agree quite reasonably. And I find very interesting, actually, that at mid-latitudes, which is where the sunspots start their cycle, it, roughly speaking, agrees with the solid body we think right into the center, solid body rotation in the interior. And the transition point is the surname so so Takukline, there's been a big discussion here about mis mixing Greek and Latin origin words, which I'm not the person to really discuss. But anyway, that's why it's called a taco client, as I understand it. And as far as anyone can tell, the transition is incredibly sharp. We've yet to measure the extent of it. OK, so is the rotation rate constant, or does it vary with time? So this is the rotation rate at any one latitude. We know it varies with latitude, but if I stick at one latitude, does that vary? And the answer is, yes, it does. And it's doing over a scale that we can, we can measure. So there are, and Roger showed the picture earlier, migrating belts of faster and slower rotation in the convection zone. And I'll show you a picture and make it slightly clearer. And they're known as zonal flows or torsional oscillation. And they're synchronized with the magnetic cycle. Been measured since 95 with various medium degree, medium L data, gong, MDI, and um, HMI. Um, and I'll show you an, an image of the rotation rate as a function of latitude compared with the average for that latitude. And, uh, but first of all, I should remind you what the um, surface looks like, what the sunspots look like, so called butterfly diagram. Um, I've now got about a century's worth of data here, so any one of the wings of the butterfly is one cycle. And sunspots start off at high latitude and migrate with time down towards the, the equator. That's how the sunspots move. And you can see the same sort of structure here in these bands. So there's north-south symmetry by definition, so don't read anything into that at all. Um, but it looks prettier if you do both sides. Um, latitude and date. Um, so anywhere that you've got red, you're seeing that the rotation rate is higher than you would expect for that latitude. So you can see that they move down. So let's mark them. Cycle 23, cycle 24, beginnings of cycle 25. OK, that's fine. But what about that lot? Sunspots, did, we didn't see any of them heading towards the pole. That's somewhat interesting. The other thing that's really quite interesting is, where on earth is it in this, in cycle 25? Okay, it's nice and strong there, you wouldn't dispute it, but what about here? It looks, maybe it's heading that way. So, you start to say, okay, well, maybe we're wrong to average over two cycles. Let's average each one independently, which is what is done here. We have cycle 23 and cycle 24, and you get what you expect here, and you can begin just about oops, to see the polewood bit. I don't think people seriously understand this, 
Um, so if I look at the difference in the mean rates for the two cycles, whoops, sorry, wrong button, cycle 24 minus cycle 23, at low latitudes, cycle 24 is a bit faster. You then, again, where the sunspots originate, they're about the same. And then you get this going off a cliff. Cycle 24 is slower in the high latitudes. The current thinking is that this is to do with the polar field, but still very much an active research area. OK, stars that oscillate. Astero seismology. So I'm, again, big choices. I'm going to stick with the stars with the outer convection zone and oscillations that are like the oscillations in the sun. The um, fundamental period we've seen will scale with size, so I'm in red giants, so these are going to be quite big. Very difficult from the ground, both um, in terms of the frequency. I sympathize with you, Connie, trying to get your stars and some of the amplitude. But the satellite age is just a real bonus for this. And um, Jan has some credit to take. And we now have not one or two, but thousands or many thousands. So the NASA Kepler mission, um, and out of this is formed um, the Kepler Astroseismic Consortium, Jan and his workers in Denmark, convinced NASA that you might have decided this was for um, finding planets, but we can use the same data, no change, to look for astroseismology. And if we can get astroseismology of um, a star around which you found a planet, we can tell you about the star. And you were very convincing. So for no money, as I understand it, we got access, proprietary access to the data. We had to promise in our pain of death not to find any planets. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, I'm going to skip the main sequence there, except to come to a planet finding one. So Kepler was designed to find rocky planets um, by the transit method. So you obstruct um, the light from the star as you go around. And this is a picture of so-called Kepler-21. The seismology will tell you the mass and radius of the star, and therefore will tell you something about the relative size, or oh, sorry, the transit tells you the relative sizes and therefore gives you the size. So. Kepler-21, a um, bit more massive star, a bit more massive than the sun, a bit more evolved, uh, a rocky planet, about one and a half times the size of the Earth. And then we begin to get departures, orbiting every 2.8 days at a distance of 4.3%. OK, so not exactly in the Goldilocks zone. <laughs> However, Kepler was unexpectedly brilliant for red giants. Now, I should say that um, we should be grateful that Gaia had not produced its results at the, when the stars were selected. Some red giants were put in for astrometric reasons. They're bright, so you can see them a long way away, and therefore they gave you a position scale. But the algorithms that selected lower main sequence stars like the Sun, because that's what they wanted to find planets around, also let in lots of red giants. So I'm very pleased that Gaia wasn't there to say, nah, nah, it's a red giant. So the red giants are actually easier than some objects for Kepler because the signal level is now millimagnitudes, not micromagnitudes. And it didn't require rapid measurements because the periods are longer. So the standard 30 minute cadence was, was good. And that meant that the telemetry was not too serious. You get a rich spectrum with radial and non-radial oscillations, and that in itself was actually um, an important statement because before um, Coro, which is this is the picture of Coro and Kepler, um, they hadn't really seen the non-radial oscillations. 
Uh, we could see the onset of helium burning, which I will discuss shortly. Rotation and Connie, um, I'm, I'm not going to say any more about it. We've, we've heard about it. But um, the interesting point here to me, who worked on the rotation rate of the core of the sun and showed that, boringly, it goes round at the same rate, I would argue, as regions further out. Red giants, not like that. Um, wonderfully fast. And if you want to understand the history of um, the Milky Way, galactic archaeology, um, again with the red giants, you can see them a long way out, so you can then map quite a big region. But what I wanted to just finish with was um, helium burning. So this is um, an HR diagram, um, Kepler stars colored by mass, um, some tracks that are of a different color, for which I apologize. The red one is solar, uh, and the others are somewhat more massive. And these are Kepler stars. So a key transition point in the evolution of a star is when it starts not only to burn hydrogen, but it starts to burn helium. And, OK, it's great. Um, so um, I should have had an animation there. I don't know what's happened to it. Maybe it'll come later. Um, stars move up the red giant branch, ignite helium at the top, and move down towards the red clump. So this region here should contain stars on the way up and stars that have come down. And in the process of uh, doing that transition, they've started to burn helium. But can you sort out, can't tell from the surface effects, can you sort out quite what, what you're actually seeing? So the RGB have not ignited helium, the red clump have. Uh, you saw the pictures earlier as to how you might do this, but seismology tells you. So this is actually my analysis. Um, the red is the red giant branch stars, so you can see them, whoa, sorry, sorry going all the way up, you can see the red clump stars that have come down and are all sitting there, nicely overlapped. You didn't stand a cat in hell's chance of picking them out otherwise. And actually, the more massive ones, the secondary clump stars, a little bit hotter, sit further over there. And that's transformative, the fact that you can tell that. So, only a small sample of the successes of helio and astro seismology. There's enough data to challenge and assist the building of stellar and galactic models. We're always happy to help you guys. Um, and the future is really very bright. So a whole series of applications which I've discussed and enormous credit to the prize winners for the work they did in founding and progressing this field. So thank you. <laughs>